Hey, welcome to On This Hill, a podcast of Church on the Hill. We are one church in two locations here in Salem and Kaiser, Oregon. And uh, this is Pastor Bruce, the lead pastor of Church on the Hill. I'm Jason, the senior associate pastor. And you guys sent us some great questions this week. The goal of this podcast is to look a little bit deeper at some of the sermons that we're doing and uh, maybe just field some questions that people might have for a pastor. Um, I've been goaded into this one, but I'm not going to do it. The, the most interesting one was which pastor would win in an arm wrestling competition. And then they added on to this, they think you would win because they say, I think Bruce <laughs> is pretty yoked. So, Fortunately, we don't have to deal with that today. That that's going to okay. be a different podcast, maybe later in the yeah. summer. When... I, I just want to say I'm tired of being underestimated. Yeah. I, I, I'm scrappy. You know uh, yeah. People people I people underestimate so. me. You're from, fight. Uma, you're from Uma, I, Umatilla, right? I promise you. So I'm, yeah, the Umatilla. farm boys in Umatilla are nothing yeah, to mess we, with. We we're knuckle draggers. We know how to fight. <laughs> uh, but seriously, there, man, you guys really did send in some yeah. awesome questions this week, and we're not going to be able to get to all of them. But we wanted to look at a few that are more on the pastoral side. And the first one I think we found really intriguing, and it is this. How do we know we're living our life in God's image? Um, maybe, Bruce, could we just start with what is what, what do they mean? Should we be living our life in God's image? What does it mean to, to yeah. be the image of God? Yeah, I mean, if I'm understanding the question right, I think um, what they're asking is how, do, how, do, how does my human life kind of reflect um, God's life? present in me. Like last week we had this question about divinity and humanity, how do they intersect, you know? And so that was a good conversation. And this week I think it's kind of a similar question, maybe from a different angle, right? But how do I reflect the image of God? If God is real or a reality in my life and uh, His Word is impacting my life, changing me, what does that look like? How does it express itself? So there's a passage of Scripture that I've always loved. It's out of John. And John is describing uh, the life or the light of God coming into the world. Of course, he's speaking about the Messiah, Jesus. But he says in John 1.12, to everyone who received Him, meaning the Messiah, Mm -hmm. to those who believed in His name, the name of Jesus, He gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of a natural descent, nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but children born of God. Mm. Born of God. And so it's just a fascinating thought. He's describing a different context of family, right? We all understand family. Mm -hmm. Mothers and fathers have babies, and they're male and female, and boys and girls, and they grow up, and they sort of look like their parents, Mm -hmm. and they soak up their parents' culture in the home. They soak up their parents' values, hopefully. The parents train those children the way they should go. But John's describing... This, sole- this divine parenting, this, mm. this heavenly Father that Jesus came and said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we look at Jesus and we can see a, an image of God in, in the flesh, right. in Jesus. And so I think the question, how do we live our life, is our lives begin to look like Jesus. That's the mm-hmm. beauty of having the Gospels, is if we want to know what God looks like, yeah. the Father gave us Jesus on the earth. Yeah. I think it would be fair, or maybe I should ask you, do you think it's fair to say that um, because we see in Scripture we were created in the image of God, that there's at least some degree every human form is the image of God? Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why we we, um, feel the way we do about uh, abortion. Mm-hmm. The way we feel, the way we human do. Human rights. Uh, yeah, human rights. Because every person is an image bearer of God. You were fir- So in that question, how do I know? First of all, I think part of it is just intrinsic to the way you were created. You were created an image bearer of God. But to go deeper, like Bruce just did, like I think that's, that's like that next step. Like, okay, I'm not just passively the image of God. Mm-hmm. In that He made me, and so I reflect His creativity, I reflect partially his mind. Uh, it's not the human form, but there's something deeper about it. But then to be active in it, not just passive, but I'm actively going to live my life the way I believe, like you're saying, yeah. that Jesus would live his life. I think, it's crazy to think that human development is not static. I mean, right. we, we've all had uh, children, or most of us, many of us have children, and we love them. Oh, the two-year-old stage, it's so cute. The three-year-old stage, the five-year-old stage, the toddler stage. <laughs> uh, but we know as parents, our kids don't stay there. They continue to mm-hmm. develop. So think of the, the thought that comes to my mind is we're, something is forming us. Now, mm-hmm. children hopefully are being formed and shaped right. in their character, in their behavior, in, in, in who they are, in their giftings and wiring by parents. Well, as believers, something should be shaping mm-hmm. our lives 
And the Bible's pretty clear about that, where Paul would speak about it in the book of, you know, in, in his in some of his writings, he said, don't be mm-hmm. conformed, don't let the world shape your behavior, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so right. that you can demonstrate the good and acceptable will of God. So something is going to... We don't live in a neutral universe. That's right. a that's a naive thought that, no, nothing's going to shape my life. Something's going to shape my life. Yeah. When I think of... Uh... Like you mentioned family, when I think of our family in particular, when I look at your boys, uh, I can see you. I can see your image there. Oh gosh, it's frightening. Yeah, they they look a lot like you. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's one thing to be like, okay, that's my image. There it is. But then to raise your child to be something, to have the culture of your family to be like you in the ways that you want them to be like you. I have a, a biological and an adoptive daughter, and uh, one of them obviously looks more like me than the other one. Uh, but both of them, we we spent we spend their life shaping them and molding them, and yeah. and some of it is already in them. Uh, I think about that too. When you think about um, the image of God, there's the image of God, but then there's our sin nature. I think that's where some people get confused. Of well, are we the image of God or are we sinners? And the answer is yes. You're right. Yeah, because yeah. it's the old it's it's the age old sort of uh, problem of is it nature or is mm-hmm. it nurture? So that's interesting because the gospel addresses both of those things. That scripture I just read, he gave those who believe in the Messiah the right to become the children of God. So just a few chapters later, Jesus will be having this conversation with a with a religious leader and yeah. Nicodemus, and he says, what do I have to do to get into the kingdom? Right. So he's kind of talking about a, a membership thing, and Jesus said, you need to be born again. So the born again puts it in an entirely different light. Oh, I don't just need outward shaping or reformation. Mm-hmm. I need inward transformation. Right. So there's the nature of God. I have been born of God. I've been given a new life. That's what that term born again means. My old life has passed away. My my new life has has begun. But once that new life begins, I still need nurturing. I still need shaping because we're all born we're at the beginning. We're all born kind of yep. needing needing the, the formation that comes with life. Yeah. So I maybe... We'll kind of land and then go to the next question, but the, the question, I want to give it as, as clear an answer as we can. How do we know we're living our life in God's image? Would it be fair to say, what do you think? Um, Jesus is the exact representation of the image of God. He's exactly what the Father wanted to say. He's the Word made flesh. And so certainly He is the standard of, am I living my life in God's image? Am I living my life like Jesus? Um and, and I remember in the 90s, everyone wore the, uh, remember the bracelet? What would Jesus do bracelet? What yeah. would Jesus do? There's nothing, that's a great question. Yeah, it That's is. a great question to ask. But I think sometimes we get stuck, well, culturally he did this, this is 2023. I, I, the thing I would try to bring it down to at its core to answer the question of this person is, am I in submission to the Father like Jesus was? Yeah. Am I submitting my life? To, like Jesus was, because that's that's what he w- did, and I think that's what we're called to in in being image bearers. We think about this current culture, whatever the current culture happens to be, whether it's 2003 or whether it's 1993 or 1963 or whatever, current culture is always going to want to shape us or shape the church. And so mm-hmm. another way of maybe looking at this question is, how do I know I'm, I'm in the image of God or being shaped into that image is... Well, Paul was pretty clear when he described the fruit of the Spirit of God in us in Galatians. He said the fruit of God's life in an individual, in a believer, is going to be love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and so forth, self-control. So I think a real practical question to ask ourselves is, does my life, is my life producing fruit? Not am I perfect yet or have I arrived yet, but when I look at my old life before I met Jesus or became a follower of Jesus, my life produced a lot of bad fruit. There was a lot of things that came out that were the opposite of peace, the opposite of patience or kindness. Well, is my life producing good fruit? That's relatively easy, I Mm -hmm. think, to measure and to see. Am I am I am I be, becoming more kind? Am I am I more patient? Am I do I have more self control? Because isn't that what we look for in mm-hmm. children? Right? Yeah. I mean, we say, okay, it's time to grow up. Mm-hmm. Right? That's kind of the the, the go to line of parents. Come on now, grow up. I want you to grow up. I think it's the same with our walk with Jesus. We there's times where you know in the New Testament we're called to grow up. Speaking of growing up, that leads us to I think the next question um, follows really well from this. 
And uh, man, I want to honor this question because um, I, I think it's very serious. The person is saying, I'm wanting to fully forgive and not hold any bitterness in my heart, but it keeps popping up. What are some tools to move forward in this area of my life? And that's a great question that um, I, everybody in the world, I think, at some point has to deal with because, again, we live in a broken world and a fallen world, and people hurt each other. Yeah. People let each other down. People disappoint one another. People can be mean. People can be evil to one another. And so, again, I'm back to the shaping idea. Uh, when I'm hurt, when I'm wounded, that has power. Right. Uh, that has power over me if I'm not careful. It has power to shape me. Uh, that wound or that offense can cause me to respond in kind, can cause me to respond in anger, cause me to withdraw, cause me to go into depression. So somehow God has not left us at the mercy mm -hmm. of circumstances, even terrible circumstances, right? And so the one thing, power can do a lot of things. You think about the power let's just say we're in a concentration camp and the guards or this the wicked people running this camp have power over when I go to bed, when I move around, when I work, when I don't. They have power to get me, but they, they can't make me hate. Right. They can't make me hate. I, I have the power of hope mm -hmm. and I have the power of forgiveness. And so that obviously comes from tapping into a greater power. Yeah, I would, I would be curious um, from this person what it is that's popping up. Um, because I've, we've talked to a lot of people yeah. over the years mm -hmm. that have had, you know, asked us this question about how do I forgive and then how do I keep forgiving? Um, cause if what's popping up is just a feeling of being hurt, we don't, I don't see a guarantee that that feeling's ever going to go away. Right. Now I've, I've watched it go away with people. I've seen it happen, but I've seen other people that have just had to live in the pain of that forgiveness for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And the hurt was would still pop up, uh, but they chose to not not hold that against the other person. And, and that's the thing I, I was thinking of when I just read this question a few minutes ago for the first time, was um, when we forgive someone, it's not saying, um, ah, don't worry about it. Or it it didn't doesn't happen. matter. It didn't happen. Yeah. It's not saying there's no debt. It's acknowledging there is a debt. You owe me. You right. hurt me. And it, it cost me something. And so rather than saying, I'm going to make you pay for what you did, forgiveness is saying, I'll bear the cost. It costs something, and Jesus bore the cost for me and what I did, and I owe him something. But because he owed, because I owed him this much, I'm going to find it in my heart to forgive you yeah. this, this much. It, and it doesn't say it's nothing, but it, it cost. And so if you're feeling the cost... I, I would say um, I don't. I can't promise that'll ever go away completely. You might still feel badly, but that doesn't mean you're not forgiving. Keep forgiving. Keep doing it over and over again. So they're asking specifically, what are some of the tools to move forward in this area of my life? Um, I want to give a really simple one that doesn't work for everyone or for every situation. But someone told me this a long time ago. Um, and uh, I was living in a Christian community. We were all trying to work together and, and spend too much time together, enough that you get really annoyed and frustrated with each other at times. And there was someone who had offended me and hurt me. And uh, a friend told me, because I would, I would try, I would do my best, I forgive them, but then I'm still in community, I'm still living with them, and they would just keep frustrating me. And someone told me, hey, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also invest in their life, like literally, and don't tell them you're doing it. Don't, right. don't say, yeah. I want to do this for you yeah. because you're annoying, <laughs> right. but just secretly give to them and invest in their life. And before you know it, your heart will move towards them. You'll, you'll start to love them in a way you didn't think you could before. And it was, I found it to be true. Yeah. The more I invest in someone, even someone I dislike or who hurt or frustrated me, the more I started to actually feel God's love for them because he's invested in their life. And once I started investing in their life, it, it changed. Now, I say that clearly... This question could cover a wide range of things. If right. someone has been abusive towards you and, and you need to cut 
Sometimes you have to cut people out of your life. Yeah. Forgiving them doesn't mean ever trusting them again, sometimes. Uh, but in the m more minor areas, I would say you can find ways to actually invest in them, and it will change the way that stuff pops up in your heart. I think that's important to make the distinction that forgiveness yeah. and trust are two different things. And, and the distinction for me is this. I, I'm not much for bumper sticker theology, but I mm. saw a bumper sticker years ago that I took a picture of it. I was behind the car, and it said this, forgiveness is giving up any hope of a better past. Mm. So part of forgiveness is dealing with... Mm -hmm. Is, is recognizing what happened in my past, but that past is unchangeable right. and coming to grips with that. So I, I, forgiveness is releasing the debt that someone owes, but part mm -hmm. of it is futuristic as well. So the idea of praying for somebody or mm -hmm. wishing someone well or looking out for their well-being is, is really sort of an act of, uh, of sacrifice and gratitude. You know, uh, worldly, even, even, excuse me, the word secular psychologists and scientists have found that gratitude and anger can exist in your brain simultaneously because mm -hmm. they're going to produce different hormones and they can't exist simultaneously. So gratitude and anger, one has to leave. So what I do by serving others, what I do by recognizing what I do have, a common offense is, is being raised by, um, and this is just from our experience, but an abusive father, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of things I could look at and see that my father perhaps did wrong or that hurt me. But there is some gratitude in the nugget there of, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my Absolutely. father, right? And so there's this idea of, God, I'm going to sacrifice my feelings. I'm going to leave my past in your hands because I can't change it. And you're going to redeem what needs to be redeemed. But I'm going to live facing forward. I'm not going to live my life facing backwards towards what happened to me. I want to live my life facing forward and that's where God waits for us. That's a great way of saying it. Live your life facing forward. Because like, yeah, I, you, you you say you're not a bumper sticker guy, but you even send me pictures of bumper stickers I do sometimes. read bumpers. Sometimes it's fascinating what yeah. comes out in just a slogan or a, yeah. one line. But Okay, I think it's worth going to the next one, maybe make this our last one. Um, and it, I think it lives in the same world of what we've been talking about yeah. already, the image of God, how do we live our life. It's It's this. How do you navigate a relationship when the other person is not a believer? <laughs> this could be an entire uh, podcast right here, but mm -hmm. the short answer is it really depends on what that relationship is. Yeah, right. Business Are we talking about a friendship, a, a marriage? A marriage, and, and of course, but I still think some of the, the basic principles still apply. Um, there's a passage in the Old Testament where God is speaking to one of his prophets who have... Uh, He's, it's, he's bringing rebuke because they have drifted from obedience, they've drifted from relationship with him, and God calls them back, and it's a much longer story than we have time for, but he basically there's this line in there that he says, listen, he that honors me, I will honor. So in every relationship, I want to do what honors God, and if I honor God, he's going to, he's going to go to work on my behalf in, in the relationship. Whether I'm navigating a, a work relationship or an interpersonal relationship, a church relationship, or even a marriage relationship, I can't lose if I have God, if I'm, if I'm agreeing with God, not getting God to agree with me, mm -hmm. if I'm agreeing with God as to what he's saying about the relationship. I, this is one of the reasons why um, I love how the New Testament's 2,000 years old, yet incredibly relevant. That if you look at the New Testament, you yeah. will find that the the first century church found themselves in these circumstances over and over again. A, a spouse would become a believer, right. and they have an unbelieving spouse across right. from them. Uh, a, a a slave would become a believer, and their owner is not, their master is not a believer. A master would become a believer, and suddenly it changes everything in these dynamics. And so Scripture speaks to this, and it, it seems to have a, um, a consistent uh, hope that you can win someone by your conduct, that, that your witness is one thing, but your conduct is another. And that, that's what I would want to point out. And now, again, what relationship we're talking about makes a big difference, but how you conduct yourself in this relationship yeah. will be their impression of Jesus. Yeah. Because we read the Word, but other people don't read the Word, they read us. Yeah. 
as, as far as they're concerned, we are Christianity. If you're a believer, you're, you're Christianity. And so how they read your life is going to mean everything to them about what they think about Christianity. So how you conduct yourself, not just what you say. What you say is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. It's very, very important. But you can say the sweetest, most loving Christian things, but if your conduct is not that, then I would say uh, their, their biggest impression is going to be, oh, Christians are hypocritical. They say one thing, but they do another. Now, unfortunately, none of us can live up to... We, none of, we all can speak better than we can say. So there's going to be some hypocrisy in every single life. Yeah. This isn't just a Christian some problem. lag time. <laughs> every... Every human has hypocrisy in them. So I, I don't always like just leveling it at Christians. But the, th the thing that makes the difference is, am I transparent in that? Can I say, here's the standard, here's the scriptural standard, here's the standard I want to hold myself to, and here's where I fail in it? Because yeah. that is a huge witness to people. When they see, like, oh, you hold this view, but you're humble in it. Like, you, you show me where you fail in it. That, that is a giant witness to people. It reminds me of something that was said uh, years ago that there's five Gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and us. Mm -hmm. And most people are not going to read the first four. Yep. So the question here, you know, how do I navigate it? I think maybe the question that would come up is, well, what's your motive in the relationship? Yeah. Is it self-serving? Mm -hmm. Is it to love someone? Is it to bring the light to someone? Is it to help someone else? And so there's a lot of things that will spin off of this. Yeah. But um, do I want to see God honored in this? And Maybe I'm here, be, I'm on an assignment. Yeah. Uh, maybe God's put me in this relationship and uh, because there's something He wants to accomplish through me. Okay, we better start wrapping this up, but I want to say something to that. You, you said, maybe I'm on an assignment. I just want to, I want to, I want to be clear with people. Because you've been in youth ministry, yeah. I've worked around <laughs> youth. You'll yeah. you'll talk to a young person, and they'll say like, "Oh, I'm I'm going with this girl, yeah. but she's not a believer." And and I know my what I say to that is, "Where are you going?" I, maybe kids don't even say this anymore. I'm going with this girl. They just yeah. start a relationship. But when we were young, younger, that's what they were saying. Because. Uh, you can't have the same, you can't actually be going together unless you've chosen the destination. Yeah, together. the final destination. And so whether it's uh, a young person looking for a relationship or a man looking for a business partner or someone looking for a spouse, I would say don't get into a relationship with someone unless you've decided on the destination together because you, you'll you find yourself eventually at odds. They've decided to go this way and your life is going this way. Yeah. And that's why the scripture speaks about being unequally yoked. Yeah. In other words, the two oxen are only going to go the same direction. They're, they're yoked together. So you don't want to yoke with someone who has a different destination in mind. That's why I think Solomon, you know, in, in, the, in, in, in the wisdom literature, he says the end of a matter is better than the beginning because in the beginning, there's all kinds of mixed motives, whether that's a business relationship or a marriage relationship or, or, or something like that, where Paul's very clear in the New Testament, he says, don't be yoked with an unbeliever. It doesn't say don't hang around or don't be around or don't share your life. He just right. says don't be yoked. And so that should give us pause when we're entering into some kind of a serious context mm -hmm. of a relationship with somebody. Hey, I'm not going to be yoked. I could work around this. I could work with this. But yoked is, a, is an entirely, I think, different yeah. category. So. Yeah, so scripturally you see a difference between what scripture says to people that find themselves in that relationship. They find, they, they're saved and they're well, I'm already in this business partnership. I'm already in this marriage. But as another right. thing to say to people that are beginning that relationship. Yeah. So it's worth paying attention to. It's worth uh, getting wise counsel. Yep. So. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for yeah, joining us. It's been great this to time. be here with you. Yeah. Uh, send us in some more questions. We'd love to feel as many as we can. Obviously, yeah. I'm sorry for the people that sent in great ones that we didn't get to. We'll we'll get that yep. arm wrestling match uh, taken care of. We'll yep. probably do that off camera. So. And if it's been good, if you've liked what you've heard and it's enlightening and helpful to you, pass it on to somebody else. Let them know. Uh, here we are at uh, on this hill, and yep. you can find us on the platform that works for you. See you Sunday. Take care. <laughs>